Every day, workers across a wide range of industries rely on and are exposed to a substance called silica, a compound made from silicon and oxygen that makes up a large chunk of the Earth's crust. From mining and construction to healthcare and even electronics manufacturing, silica plays an important role in a broad spectrum of industries and applications. In the U.S. alone, an estimated 2.3 million workers come into contact with silica at their workplaces. This exposure is particularly high in sectors like construction, manufacturing, and mining. But did you know that exposure to silica dust can actually cause serious health problems if not managed properly? Given the widespread exposure to silica and its associated health hazards, it's important to understand how to protect yourself. In this training, we're going to cover respirable silica and its health effects, methods for preventing silica exposure, your employer's responsibility to protect you, and how to respond to suspected silica exposure. By the end of the course, you should have a stronger understanding of the hazards of silica dust and the steps you can take to protect yourself and your coworkers. Let's start with a closer look at respirable silica and its potential health effects. So what exactly is respirable silica? Well, silica comes in different forms. We're most interested in crystalline silica, a substance found in many earth-based materials like sand, rock, concrete, bricks, and even glass, pottery, and ceramics. This makes crystalline silica an especially common substance in manufacturing, construction, and mining where silica-containing materials are routinely processed. Now, crystalline silica only really becomes dangerous when it's turned into dust. Then it's called respirable crystalline silica. Anytime you cut, grind, drill, blast, or crush silica-containing materials, you create clouds of hazardous dust that, when inhaled, pose a serious risk to your health. Silica dust particles are seriously small, about 100 times smaller than ordinary grains of sand making them easy to inhale and make their way deep into our lungs. To protect us, OSHA has set the permissible exposure limit, or PEL, for silica at 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air over an eight-hour workday. Think about it this way. For a room measuring 10 by 10 feet, the allowable concentration of silica dust would be less than the amount needed to cover Abraham Lincoln's forehead on a penny. For an area the size of a football field, the permissible limit would be equal to a single packet of sugar. Exposure over this limit can lead to serious health effects. The impact of silica on your health doesn't show up immediately, but when it does, it can be life-threatening. For example, silicosis is an incurable lung disease caused by inhaling silica dust and forming scar tissue in the lungs. Over time, it can lead to severe breathing problems and even respiratory failure. Silica exposure can also lead to lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and kidney disease. That's why we've got to do everything we can to prevent exposure to silica in the workplace. So, in the next section, we'll look at a few methods for doing just that. To prevent silica exposure, we use three primary strategies engineering controls, safe work practices, and personal protective equipment, or PPE. Engineering controls aim to control dust at the source and include wet methods, vacuum dust collection systems, and isolated methods. Wet methods use water or foam to dampen dust, preventing it from becoming airborne. Water sprays can be used with jackhammers or drills, while masonry saws and other handheld tools can be fitted with water feed attachments. Vacuum dust collection systems work by capturing and containing dust as soon as it's generated. Centralized vacuum systems can collect dust from multiple sources on large work sites, while local exhaust ventilation can be used to collect dust generated at the source. Now, Isolated methods create barriers to divert dust away from workers. This includes process enclosures that isolate dust-producing activities, using airborne dust barriers in construction, and protecting operators in enclosed cabins when using large machinery. 
Safe work practices are about doing things the right way to minimize silica exposure, like inspecting your engineering controls to make sure they're working properly before work, monitoring dust levels during work, strategically timing dust intensive tasks when fewer workers are on site, and following proper housekeeping procedures so you don't kick up dust. For example, using wet sweeping instead of dry sweeping. Lastly, PPE comes into play when dust can't be controlled by other means. Although always worn, protective equipment is designed to be your last line of defense. Silica dust exposure protection systems include equipment like N95 masks or respirators, eye protection, and protective clothing to avoid dust settling on your regular clothes and then becoming airborne later. Now, of course, your PPE needs to properly fit and be maintained to be effective. You should replace respirator cartridges, masks, and any defective equipment as needed. Now, it's important to note here that while engineering controls and safe work practices help protect everyone, PPE only protects the person wearing it. Again, it's your last line of defense, not a replacement for other prevention measures. There are also a few personal habits you should maintain that can help keep you safe from silica exposure. Don't eat, drink, or smoke in dusty areas. Wash your hands, arms, and face before meals or breaks. Wear disposable or washable work clothes, and if possible, shower and change before leaving the work site. Now that we have an idea of the control methods available, let's talk about your employer's responsibility for protecting you from silica exposure. Your employer plays a significant role in protecting you from silica exposure. They're responsible for making safety plans, implementing them, training you on compliance, and offering free medical testing to employees who need them. An important part of this responsibility is to create a written exposure control plan. You can find sample exposure control plans and templates online, which can be helpful in giving you a sense of what an effective plan looks like. The first thing to note on this plan is the designated competent person, someone appointed by your employer to ensure the exposure control plan is working. Their job is to inspect the worksite, identify silica hazards, and address them. Every team member should know who the designated competent person is. The next thing you'll notice on the plan is a list of tasks that involve silica exposure and the specific control measures designed to mitigate risk. To help select which control should be used, OSHA provides a table of specified exposure control methods which is particularly relevant in the construction field. This guide, often referred to as Table 1, gives clear instructions for many common tasks and, if followed correctly, it eliminates the need for employers to measure silica exposure from those tasks. But what if you encounter tasks not listed in Table 1? Or what if you're using alternative control methods for those tasks? In these situations, your employer will need to measure silica exposure from these tasks and ensure the levels fall within OSHA's permissible exposure limits. Your employer is also required to let you observe these measurements and notify you of the results within five days. Next steps may include methods for further reducing respirable silica exposure risk before work can continue. Next, the plan should outline the housekeeping practices in place to minimize silica exposure and procedures to control employee access to certain areas where exposure risk is higher. Lastly, you'll see that the plan needs to be reviewed annually and made available to all employees. It should also detail how these requirements will be met. On the topic of health checks, Employers also have to provide free medical examinations to any employee who is required to wear a respirator for 30 or more days a year. These exams should be scheduled within 30 days of initial assignment, at least once every three years after, and include chest x-rays and lung function tests. It's important to note that all costs associated with these exams, including travel time and expenses, should be covered by your employer. And remember, these exams are private. You control the information. The doctor will provide a report to your employer that the exam took place, 
that it met OSHA requirements and any recommendations for limitations or respirator use. But further details about your results are shared only with your explicit consent. Finally, your employer must keep detailed records of all exposure measurements and medical exams. This is an essential part of OSHA compliance and worker protection. While preventative steps are critical, it's just as important to know how to respond if you suspect you've been exposed to silica. If you're working and you think you might be exposed, stop the work immediately. Your health is important and you have every right to a safe workplace. The job can wait. Next, tell your supervisor or competent person immediately. Your concerns matter and need to be investigated. The work stays paused until it can be properly assessed. If there is a silica hazard, you'll need to take corrective action. This could mean additional sampling, fixing a faulty control, using a respirator, or adding more engineering controls. If necessary, update the written exposure control plan to reflect the situation and any corrective actions taken. But what if you think you were previously exposed or you're experiencing worrying symptoms? Don't wait report it immediately, and get it checked out by a medical professional. As always, your health should be your top priority. We covered a lot of important information about respirable silica, so let's go over some of the highlights. We learned what respirable silica is, how it's created, and the severe health effects it can cause if inhaled including silicosis, lung cancer, and other respiratory diseases. We discussed how to prevent silica exposure through sampling, engineering controls, safe work practices, personal protective equipment, and personal hygiene. We covered the responsibilities your employer has in protecting you from silica exposure, such as formulating a written exposure control plan, providing free medical exams, and keeping detailed records of exposure measurements. Finally, we discussed how to respond and immediately report if you suspect a silica exposure. Preventing silica exposure is a collective responsibility, and it starts with getting educated on the topic. Hopefully, this training's helped you feel more prepared to stay safe on the job and look out for your coworkers too. Remember to keep your eyes open, speak up when you need to, and never forget, your health always comes first.